the Babylonian exile would be fairly short-lived, uh, less than a century, but would be highly consequential for Jewish history. Let's have a quick look at this brief period of time that had a major impact on the development of Jewish thought and Jewish religiosity, and of course the story of the Jewish people. This 19th century painting is inspired by the famous uh, Psalm 137 that begins with the phrase, by the rivers of Babylon, which describes the Jews being taken off into exile. You can see here uh, the, uh, the, the patriarch of the clan is, is wearing a shackle on his wrist. And uh, there we sat down, the psalm goes on, and we wept when we remembered Zion. Uh, meaning when they remember their homeland in Judah. Uh, and they were forced by their Babylonian captors to sing them a song of Zion. So hence the, the harp there that's uh, being held by the patriarch and everyone is very sad. And, and indeed this passage is a very moving depiction of the sadness and frustration and anger that the Jews felt at being displaced from their homeland by Nebuchadnezzar. The conqueror, of course, was Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Here you see a, uh, uh, an arrowhead that was discovered in the region. There's extensive evidence of destruction throughout the land of Judah. Benjamin, however, was apparently not uh, devastated to the same degree, which indicates that it may have uh, surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar without violence. But there's extensive evidence of the incursion of the uh, uh, Babylonians into the region uh, wreaking havoc beginning in 604 before the Common Era. There are some uh, attempts at revolt against Nebuchadnezzar and uh, there, uh, one of the ways in which the Babylonians respond is through progressively exiling the leadership of the region, although it's still a comparatively small number, less than 5,000 if you look, for example, in the book of Jeremiah. There is some indication that, as we saw earlier with Sancheru's uh, exiles, that uh, the leadership and also skilled craftsmen and potentially military personnel were especially targeted for these uh, expulsions to Babylon. There was no, however, corresponding uh, influx of population, as we saw under the Assyrians, uh, the, the goal was to simply displace those people who might influence the population to continue their revolt without necessarily transplanting new populations in their place. But we have massive destruction, particularly in the final campaign that begins in the year 587 and will culminate in the destruction of the temple. Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of the temple is one of the most prominent dates in Jewish history. Uh, it's usually associated with the year 586 before the Common Era, but in the Jewish psyche it is huge. It is There's a whole series of dates that are associated with the, the siege beginning, the breaching of the walls, and ultimately the burning of the temple, um, and those dates are actually incorporated into the Jewish liturgical calendar with a series of fasts beginning in the summer and culminating in the late summer on the date of Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av, which usually falls uh, in late July or early August of the Gregorian calendar. And the, uh, the this whole period, the three weeks between the uh, breaching of the walls and the destruction of the temple is observed as a form of semi-mourning by Jews, even to this day, with the limitation on certain types of celebrations, some communities will refrain from haircuts and so on, listening to live music, all kinds of restrictions meant to reflect upon the uh, horrendous meaning of the destruction of the temple uh, in this year. This is Solomon's temple, of course, that we're discussing, and this entire period from Solomon's creation of the temple, which would have been in the 10th century up until its destruction in the 6th century is collectively referred to as First Temple Period. The Second Temple would refer to the rebuilding of the temple uh, uh, under Cyrus, which we'll discuss in a couple of videos. At any rate, uh, one more element that's especially important to note is that Nebuchadnezzar 
uh, placed a person in charge, a Jewish leader in charge of the entire community, with the hopes that uh, this individual, Gedalia ben Achikam, would uh, calm the local population and keep them from any further revolts. But he was actually killed in an assassination by other Jewish leaders, by uh, people who uh, were more hot-headed and wanted to rebel against Babylon. The assassination of a Jewish leader by other Jews is also marked in the Jewish liturgical calendar. The uh, date of his death is marked on the third day of Tishrei, which is the day after Rosh Hashanah. It's also observed as a fast day in commemoration of this horrible act of uh, uh, intracommunal violence. Fascinatingly, uh, in a nearby mitzvah was found some interesting seals, including this one that bears the inscription in Paleo-Hebrew, uh, Gedalia, who is over the house, which seems to uh, apply that Gedalia is in charge of at least this particular estate, perhaps even larger than that. Uh, many archaeologists have opined that this could easily belong to Gedalia ben Achikam, the individual that we referred to earlier. So when taken all together, besides the figures we mentioned earlier in Jeremiah, it's less than 13,000 Jews were exiled to Babylon, as far as we can tell. Um, the Babylonian exile lasted from about 586 till 539 before the Common Era, although as we shall discuss shortly, many Jews chose not to return to Israel after 539. The uh, situation of the Jews in Babylon is recorded in the biblical book of Ezekiel. He was a prophet who actually was active in the region. And uh, according to his account, many of the Jewish exiles were located in the city of Nippur and also in its surrounding area. You'll notice below Nippur is the city of Shushan, or Susa, which is the setting for the book of Esther. There's some significant scholarly concerns about the specific dating of the book of Esther, meaning when does it actually happen based on the names of certain kings and things like that but it is set between the two temple periods and all kinds of material inside the book of Esther is uh, in, in consonance with what we know about the Babylonian reign at that time as well. Uh, the Jews living in Babylon were heavily influenced by Babylonian culture at this time, most significantly with the adoption of Aramaic as a lingua franca, as a vernacular, a language that they commonly used. And ultimately, Aramaic would displace Hebrew as the living language of the Jews, and indeed of the entire Near East at this point. Uh, this is a language that would last over a thousand years. It, it is spoken even today in some parts of Syria and Turkey. It is, of course, the language of the Babylonian Talmud, and there are a few different uh, versions of Aramaic that maybe we'll discuss in a later lecture. Um, Hebrew was never abandoned, but it increasingly became the language of scholarship and liturgy as opposed to the daily language on the street. Uh, the Jews also adopted the Babylonian calendar, specifically the names of the months, Tishrei and Tammuz and so on. Uh, the, the Hebrew names for the months are simply numbers. The first month which would be Nisan in the spring, the second month and so on. And so the Babylonian uh, custom of, of naming these lunar months was applied to the Jewish calendar. It wasn't an exact fit because the Jewish calendar has a leap month on a uh, somewhat irregular appearing schedule. And so there are 12 months, but there is one of those months, the month of Adar, which occurs in early spring, which may be doubled. So you will have an Adar Rishon, an Adar One, and then an Adar Sheni, a second Adar. Otherwise, they adopted the Babylonian lunar calendar names for each of the months. Okay, let us continue with our discussion of the Persian period, which will follow in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.